All right, well, let's move forward. 1988, that's a, an election you again played a big role in, thanks in part to, to your relationship with Linda and, mm -hmm. and partly your own abilities. Tell us about Dukakis. One of my favorite uh, public officials that I've ever had the pleasure of working with, tremendous guy, I've stayed in regular contact with him since. We have a lot of laughs. Um, and I've, I've been a big admirer of his, of his career, you know, before he ran and since he ran. He's kind of the father of Amtrak as we know it today. Um, probably the single area of the United States trailing the world the most dramatically. So by the way, there are a lot of them, but this is the principle in what public transportation, high-speed rail in particular. He's been a leader in that. Um, as a candidate, he was very easy to work for. Uh, he was, you know, it's ironic that the thing people remember, there are two things people remember. One is the helmet in the tank, mm -hmm. and the other is failing to respond appropriately uh, to uh, the question about if his wife were raped and murdered with sufficient emotion. Um, the thing that's ironic about that line in the debate or that moment in the debate was that he had acquitted himself so well in all the caucus debates and all the other debates. Um, he was just very reliable. And the reason was he, 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 knew, he knew the material and he knew what he believed. And, and he was very authentic from that standpoint. He had uh, a, a group of uh, Boston Pauls around him, um, some of whom have become lifelong friends, many of whom have become lifelong friends. Um, there were two take away stunning moments in the campaign. You may remember that there was a time when Newsweek magazine was uh, breaking the story that the Dukakis campaign was responsible for the so-called Biden videotape, which drove Joe Biden out of the race because he plagiarized his right. speech. Um, and I get a call from Newsweek magazine saying that uh, they were running with a story that I was the one who had given the Biden videotape on behalf of the caucus campaign. And the rumor made perfect sense. It's just that it wasn't true. <laughs> uh, I found out later that Joe Trippi was the uh, originator of the uh, story. Um, and Dukakis called me and on the phone. And he said, uh, listen, uh, this is what Newsweek's got. This is what they're going to say. Um, and I need to know right now. He said, don't, you know, if you did it, that's you know, that's one thing we'll deal with it, but I have to know the truth. I said, I, Governor, I didn't do it. If I thought of it, I would have. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It's fair game. Right. It's just that I didn't do it. He said, well, everybody knows you're close, you know, with David Gale. I said, I, I, understand. I get it, but I didn't do it. I mean, I can't admit doing something I didn't, didn't do. And he said, well, I'm sending so-and-so uh, from my staff uh, to meet with you today. You think about this, and you understand how important this is. Oh. <laughs> so I said, okay, fine. So he sent one of his top aides out, and uh, we had lunch, and I explained again, you know, I didn't do it. Well, the irony was, the guy who came out and interviewed me was one of the two guys who did. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, so, which of course I didn't know that day, or at that time, but uh, that's the way it all worked out. And so that was a, that was a pretty serious bump in the road resulted in some staff changes. And uh, then the next thing that happened, of course, was that Iowa was facing a drought that fall. And uh, the folks at Iowa State were predicting dire crop impact. And uh, so he came out to do a, a campaign event built around the drought. And they, they had to have a farm for the backdrop that was within. 15 minutes of the Des Moines Airport and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So somebody calls me and says uh, that I should come to the Hughes Farm in Orange County and take a look. The setting was perfect. The farmer was perfect. You could count on them to say all the right things. Uh, but the problem was that we were five days out from the event. The corn looked fine. And I grew up on a farm. I mean, I know right. healthy corn from sick corn. And uh, so I said, hey, you know, blah, blah, blah. and so they got the experts on the phone that I was state and said, look, here's the deal weather forecast is X, uh, it's supposed to be hot, it's supposed to be dry, that corn is just, oh. just on the edge of turning yellow and falling over. And by, in five days, it's going to look horrible. So I said, okay, you know, they know what they're talking about. And 
two days later, unexpectedly, it turns cool. It's damp. Uh, the corn thrives. It's too late to change the event. And uh, oh, it was horrible. <laughs> it was horrible. And Dukakis, of course, not what we call tall in stature. I mean, the corn was towering over. He uh, made me feel a little better about it by later purchasing the Frank Miller cartoon uh, of tow corn towering over him and, and wrote on it to, to my dear friend Jerry Crawford, who shall never be my Secretary of Agriculture. Um, so anyway, he forgave me. Were you uh, involved in uh, his last fly-through? Yes. The night before the election? Yes. I remember uh, uh, going up and greeting him on the airport. Stairs of the, you know, that campaign had been as perfect a campaign in Iowa as I was ever involved in. Won the state by 10 points. It was the second best state in the nation after Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, obviously the next day did not go well, but uh, I was very pleased with what happened to Why do you think he won Iowa by such a large amount, other than the fact that you're a great organizer? Well, he had spent uh, 100 and some days here in the caucus campaign. What they knew. Bush had done that too? Uh, not as much. He can't be here. But he was here, yeah. Uh, the second thing is that the only issue the Republicans ever really started to penetrate on was law and order, whether Dukakis was tough enough on law and order. So what we did was we brought in a fellow by the name of Carmen Massimiano, who was the sh sheriff of, of uh, Berkshire County, Massachusetts, former president of the National Sheriff's Association. We teamed him up with Bob Rice, who by then was one of the most popular elected county officials in Iowa history, and Tom Miller, the very popular attorney general, and we put them on an airplane and we hit every single media market in Iowa talking about how tough and strong Dukakis had been on law enforcement as the governor of Massachusetts from the mouth of the sheriff from Massachusetts. And it was it was just terrific. And we did we added a lot of local Isaac Walton stops and sportsmen for the caucus and so on and so on. And, uh, and you know, the little gain they'd made in the polling opened right back up again and they never got close. Okay, so we go to 1992. Mm -hmm. Had you met Bill Clinton uh, when he was governor? Mm -hmm. What was the first time you had a chance to meet Bill Clinton? Michael Dukakis introduced me to him at the National Convention in Atlanta in 1988 and said, this young governor is going to be president said it, of course, he meant after, after he was president for, for eight years. Uh, but that didn't turn out to be the case, and that's how I met him. And he, that's when he did the nomination speech for Dukakis that went on forever, or that? Uh, yeah, yeah, he actually gave the keynote. Oh, the keynote address. Uh, yeah, and I met him when he was there to practice uh, that speech. And, uh, but he managed to make lemonade out of those lemons uh, as well by That took 48 hours. Yeah. Um, it, and it was uh, a look into the future, his ability to turn things around. Yeah. Always came back. Yeah. So in, in 1992, we have a caucus here in the state of Iowa with Tom Harkin joining. Mm -hmm. Did anything happen significant in the state then? Because uh, Clinton you know, was available if they wanted to nominate him as well. Uh, the other candidates all, in the final analysis, decided to bypass. Mm -hmm. The three of us that were closest to Clinton at that stage of the race were the late Ed Campbell, um, David O'Brien from the Woodbury County O'Briens, even though David's in Fort Bend and Cedar Rapids for a long time, and myself. Uh, and the other candidates all passed up had a lot of respect for her. Do you remember anything significant about that campaign that you want to share with us? Well, <laughs> there are a lot of things that we all remember. I, Proof of how incredible his uh, comeback powers were uh, would be, you know, the, the Jennifer Flowers yes. audio tapes. Uh, that was huge. Three weeks before the New Hampshire primary, and, and coming back from that, uh, it it's like a service letter. Yeah, uh, and it continued on into the spring. I remember talking to the late Mayor Arthur Davis. the ability to convey the country with depth 
experience to draw. And I, I've come to think of that as really the distinguishing characteristic. That convention speech made a huge difference for him too, didn't it? Things, the numbers seemed to churn after that. Absolutely. And that was an example of where a convention can make a difference. We've got a lot of team go for a good convention speech. Oh yeah, recently. recently. So. Yeah. Now, he was able to carry Iowa in the fall. Mm -hmm. Were you a part of that as well, I yes. imagine? Yes, and I was uh, uh, at the state fairgrounds on the Sunday before the general election, having lunch with him backstage, and uh, it was a glorious day, and I knew he was going to win. It was a really special afternoon. That was a beautiful event. Yeah. It was outdoors. Mm -hmm. And there was an event beforehand, I guess. Was that a fundraiser, or Tom Harkin? I know I had a lot of people there for that. Yeah, I don't recall it being a fundraiser. Just to meet and greet him. Yeah. Yeah, it was terrific. All right, so he becomes president of the United States, and there was a moment in time when he decided to come back to Iowa and play golf. Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> um, my late mother was in my law firm answering the telephone that day um, because our receptionist was ill, and I called my mom and said, Hey, do you mind coming in? Because she had worked as a receptionist, and that's the only day she ever did that in her life. And, and uh, she came running into my office like she looked like she had seen a ghost. And she said, uh, Air Force One is on the phone, and they say the president wants to talk to you. I said, well, let him. <laughs> I mean, what, what, is there a question here? <laughs> I mean, what's the, you know, and she just sort of was flustered by the, by the whole thing. And, and he said, uh, he was, he had just finished the uh, speech in Oklahoma City uh, after the bombing there. He went to the memorial service and spoke at the memorial service. And the truth of the matter is, he was just drained from the experience, emotionally drained. And uh, he was coming here uh, anyway, and he said, uh, hey, can we throw you in the golf game? He said, sure, no problem. So um, I called, I had to wait to, for a phone call from the Secret Service to there was a little gap in time. And I finally got the phone call and I called the pro shop. And Mondays, the golf course is generally closed. And so I didn't think it was going to be a problem. And uh, I called the pro shop and I started explaining to the pro that I had this call. We were going to be coming out to play, just the two of us. And I asked him if he'd heard from anybody. And he said, no, he hadn't heard from anybody. And then he kept saying, Joking, this is serious. And then all of a sudden, I heard him say, "Holy shit!" And I said, "Excuse me." And he said, "There are a bunch of guys in black suits and white shirts and black ties coming down the hill." <laughs> I said, "Yeah, <laughs> that, that that would be the secret service." <laughs> and so uh, we went out and played. Just had a blast. Um, he kept telling me I didn't have to call him Mr. President on the golf course, on the golf course but. Didn't have it in me not to. So, really well, that's not the only story that occurred that day. Your children got a chance to meet him. Yes. Do you remember that? Well, they met him on several occasions. But that day, that was, they, there was a funny comment that came out of that meeting. Um, Do you remember it? Tell, remind me. You told your son to be on his best behavior. Yes. And so um, you lined them all up. And President Clinton came and said hello to each of them. And he asked your son how he's how are you doing? And he said, I'm being good. <laughs> that was uh, that was just when he got out of his car, uh, arriving at the golf course, and then they took off. And Clinton was so delighted to be doing something different from what he'd done that morning yeah. that he was he was as loose as could be. He's, for example, he said, uh, I'm driving the golf cart. He said, it's the only thing they ever let me drive it. And uh, that was pretty funny. And secondly, I forgot to turn my cell phone off. And it rang. And he grabbed it and answered it. And, pretty, and I, he says, hello? And I'm just hearing his side of this. I have no idea what's going on. And he says, uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, Bill Clinton. <laughs> and it turned, out, it turned out later that it was uh, for a, a client of mine, uh -huh. a woman who's a client of mine. And, uh, she knew somebody was BSing her. She just didn't know who it was. And then, of course, she gets up the, 
next day and sees the picture of Clinton and myself playing golf in the register. <laughs> she's like, ah! <laughs> I don't know what she said to him, but I'm sure it was inappropriate. So that was pretty funny, and uh, yeah, we had a we had a good time. And on the first hole, it kind of is a very tough hole. It's a long uphill dog leg par four, and we had our drives about mm, four feet apart. They ended up about four feet apart. We had spectacular drives on the first hole. And the way it worked at the time was the National Press Corps could only cover the first tee, mm -hmm. so they could see who the president was playing golf with, and they weren't allowed to go out on the course. So we. Uh, Get in the cart. I'm going to clean this up a little. And uh, Clinton says, uh, "Screw them. <laughs> Doesn't matter how we hit the rest of them." <laughs> so, that was pretty funny. Too. Well, that was a big comeback moment for him too, because he had got done with the '94 election. Yeah, was declared to be irrelevant. Yeah, the bombing occurred in Oklahoma City, and he really showed again the presidential leadership you talked about yeah. by showing the great empathy he did when he went down there. He also uh, was able to. With the loss of uh, the House in the Congress, he was able to avoid some of the extreme pulls on him politically and be able to chart a slightly more centrist, co centrist course, and that was very key to his success as well. Were you actively involved at all in the Gore campaign in 2000? I was the, I was the state director for Gore, yeah. Um, I would say, since I assume is okay in Candor's fine. this format, that he, t he turned out to be the most disappointing um, candidate that I ever worked with. Um, he was personally difficult, he was professionally difficult, and he had almost no of that commodity I've already talked about, the Bill Clinton had his spades. Um, he was, uh, he was not a friendly guy. He was Well, the amazing thing was he inherited a great, you know, national economy, mm -hmm. and yeah, I think he did win the election. I still believe he did. Mm -hmm. But despite all of what you said, you know, he was able to pull that off. I remember that you uh, at that time introduced me to Tim Gannon, mm -hmm. and he was my executive director. And Tim did a phenomenal job in that election. I was very, very dedicated to Gore. Yeah. But I was like you. I didn't get. It. Yeah. I didn't get him at all. So. You know, because I was for Gore in the caucus process. I did not get to know Bill Bradley well. Um, so I don't really have the ability to compare him to Bradley, other than I saw some things out of Bradley that weren't very inspiring. Mm -hmm. We actually, uh, in my law office, um, Jeff Lincoln, myself, uh, and a friend of Jeff's, came up with the idea of having uh, placards at the Jefferson Jackson Day dinner that said, Stay and Fight as a way of pimping Bill Bradley for leaving the Senate uh, rather than stay and fight like yeah. Gore had. And uh, it got under his skin. I mean, it really got under Bradley's skin. And uh, to the extent that he left during Gore's speech, uh, during the stay and fight chants from the crowd, which were packed pretty successfully. And uh, so I, I, I don't know if Bradley was a better choice than Gore, but I, I, I just know that Gore was difficult. I think, I think that that was one of those unfortunate situations where we only had two choices, yeah. and Gore was the best one. Yeah. Um, so 2004 comes along, mm -hmm. and you get involved in the John Kerry campaign. How did you hook up with John Kerry? Boy, this is interesting. Um, it's interesting not not to start with John Kerry, but it's interesting because of John Edwards. Um, John Edwards. Well, first of all. blessed to having been asked to chair Gephardt's campaign, Kerry's campaign, John Edwards' campaign. And so I had a decision to make during the course I knew uh, Howard Dean Merrill uh, from the Democratic Governors Association, which I've been pretty involved in. And John Edwards came to our home on a Sunday morning with Roxanne Connor, 
sat at our dining room table for three and a half hours, and we talked about the world. My God, who is interested in the president? And when he left, I said to him, "He feels cold." And some people need to be the president. They need to fill right. a hole inside. I thought it thought he was sincere. I thought he felt called. I thought he was genuine. I thought he was extraordinary in a lot of ways. And Linda said, well, for my part, I thought he was the funniest son of a bitch who's ever said this day. And God bless my wife. She's had extraordinary instincts. It took a while, by the way, for her for history to prove her <laughs> quite as completely. We just decided that uh, we would uh, hash it out on a, a holiday that year. We always took the kids to Hawaii at the Christmas holiday. And uh, we made up our mind that we thought John Kerry was the best combination of uh, what he would be as a president and what the tickets, talents were he had to get to be the president. We decided to support him that way. And he, uh, like I said about Michael Dukakis earlier, uh, absolutely was. candidates you supported, I thought you made the most significant uh, difference right now. And just everything you did along the way, which included right after the governor got inaugurated, the event that you threw, yeah. that was brilliant. Uh, the breakfast, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that, that was a terrific event. John Kerry's a terrific guy. My biggest disappointment is that I didn't, <coughs> that I wasn't more forward with him after the Iowa caucuses. Mm -hmm. um, you know, along about Thanksgiving time, We made up a, a new rule that everywhere he went, he had to tell a story about the previous stop uh, to make it more anecdotal. And he turned into a storytelling son of a bitch in the best sense, and uh, really was relating to people. And he was just on fire from then on through the Iowa caucuses. He was disciplined, he was tough, he was hard working, he was brilliant. Uh, he was a foxhole guy that you could trust in the time. But when he left, started reverting to that other kind of guy, and he never kind of got back to that. And, you know, the, the reputation, the biggest gap I know of in politics is the gap between what the general public thought of John Kerry and the guy I knew. Yeah. And really, you've got to, if you were in my position, you have to take some responsibility for that, for not having, you know, I should have, I should have been more forward. I actually sent a memo into the campaign telling them that I saw that. Brother showed him the memo long after the election had come down. He was a little more irritated with me than I am, but more aggressive about it. Let's talk about two important moments during that campaign. I want to find out if you have any recollection of any involvement. The swift boat stuff, mm -hmm. the slow response. Mm -hmm. Did you do anything in that or were involved in any conference calls in that? Yes. Um, you know, it was so it was so hard to imagine here because you may recall that in the caucuses, we got a phone call four days before the caucuses mm -hmm. from somebody who carries a, had helped save the life of, pulled so, him up, drug him up out of the river into a into a boat. And so it seemed otherworldly to me that anybody could believe it. But um, that was a huge step from the caucus. Yeah. That guy come and give testimonials. Absolutely. Uh, and you know it reminded me of in retrospect of of the caucus campaign in eighty eight with the Willie Horton stuff. Seriously, and yet the lesson is learned. You can't let that sort of thing go unabated. On the swift boat thing, did you did you urge a quicker response? Uh, I think that I think I, I think that most of us did. Yeah. Uh, but again, it was you know, there, there had been several changes in the top in the campaign leadership, and uh, as has too often been. All right, let me ask you about another important moment. This is something you talked a little bit about before, the weekend before the election occurred. Mm -hmm. um, 
Bin Laden come out and said, I'm still here, I'm still alive. Yeah. Yeah, it, I'm sighing because I just had this conversation with John Sasso, who was the campaign manager down the stretch. Uh, I just had this conversation with him a few weeks ago. Uh, and he, here's the deal. John Kerry was in Madison, Wisconsin on Friday before the Tuesday general election. The Osama Bin Laden tape came out on Thursday. He was in Wisconsin on Friday. He was coming up to Des Moines on Saturday to do a speech over at the Reform over at the state capitol. Um, and I called first Sasso and then I spoke to Kerry. And I said, when, when you get to Iowa, I want the first sentence Before I begin today, I have one thing to say to this country. When I am your president, with every single breath I draw, I will permit the United States of America to find me and execute me for uh, Because I thought the country, after several years of Bush failing to achieve that, needed to hear that John Kerry was adamantly and it created a big debate inside the campaign. And the pollsters convinced Kerry that he had it won. And that while it might be a good line, it had a little risk associated with it. And that he didn't need to assume any risk because he was going to be elected on Tuesday if things just continued as they were. And so that was the decision that was made. And I, I felt I had a horrible feeling all day Saturday that we were pursuing the wrong course. Now, I can't sit here and tell you it would have been different if he had uttered the line, but I sure, I sure felt it in my bones. All right, um, let's talk about 2008. You're actively involved in Hillary Clinton's campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you recall about that whole process from the caucuses? Any lessons learned from that? Or well, obviously, you're trying to break the glass ceiling again, like, like yeah. you noted before. Yeah. Um, what I would say is that I really can't think of a single person who's more responsible for, for her defeat than me. And here's what I mean. One thing I've never stopped doing in caucuses is door knocking. I do it for my own peace of mind that I'm not missing something. And I knocked on several hundred doors in the weeks leading up to the caucuses. But I was only knocking on the doors of Democrats and of independents that occasionally showed up at Democratic caucuses. I didn't knock on the doors of any independents that don't go to the caucuses or any Republicans. And I knew she was going to call me. And uh, what I didn't anticipate was that people who we now refer to often as the Tea Party people would show up angry. Obama was at a point in his career where you could make him into anything you wanted him to be in your own mind. Um, and people were angry and desperate for change, and Obama was a perfect vehicle for that. It, it, people, you know, people remember the hope part, when in fact it was the change part. It was, a, it was a, the ultimate change election. And I just, I'll never make the mistake again of, <laughs> of only knocking on Democratic doors. And when Ann Selzer's poll came Sunday before the caucuses, I was like, that's exactly what's going on. You know, that's, it's got to be what's going on, because A, I know she's always right, right? Um, and I, I called her up because I, I wanted her to be wrong, and I was probing to figure out you know, if she could be wrong, and I could tell she was completely confident that she was right, and that we were going to get a wave of people in front of us that I've never seen before, and it's exactly what happened. So I, you know, I feel, uh, I feel If you, if you had to do it all over again, what would you have done differently to change that scenario? Um, I would have vetoed some of the crazy advice she was getting from her pollsters uh, and advocated uh, that, that she needed to be more of a change candidate herself. She had an instinct that she did need to be, you know, because her name was Clinton, because we had Bush, Clinton, Bush, she was being held accountable for the sins of those three predecessors. 
but against, there we go again with the Democratic Party, something shiny and new and irresistible. Okay, um, I don't know how much time we have left. Who, who do you see to be watching for the next Congress as an emerging candidate in the Democratic Party for president? Well, I think, I think that it's her nomination if she wants it, and I hope she wants it. Whatever reason she decides she doesn't want it, then I 